name is Kyle Cherick. I'm the host of a television show on uh, PBS called Wisconsin Foodie. And it is my great privilege to moderate this panel for the Wisconsin Restaurant Association today. Just as a show of hands before we get into it, how many of you are um, restaurateurs, owners of restaurants out here in the audience? Okay. How many of you work in a, in a uh, separate from that in some sort of administrative or managerial position within restaurant? Great, 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 great. And then how many folks are here just because, you know, someone said they had to be? Great, guy in the front. Okay, good. Co co couple three, that's it's always, there's always a few. Um, I'm gonna go down the panel and I'm gonna uh, start this discussion and, and uh, let you know who's here. And um, we'll speak for about 45 minutes. Hopefully you find it completely engaging and it really helps with your understanding of employee culture and how to create that within your organizations and operations. And then we'll leave about 15 minutes to uh, questions at the end. So if you have them along the way, if you've got a pen or what have you, scribble them down because we're definitely going to open up for that. To my left is my friend Jason Ilstrup, who is currently with Downtown Madison. Uh, I know him through his years at uh, Hotel Red as the GM. You were the founding GM there, correct? Correct, yes. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it says in your bio that you uh, were, you were, let's see, you were serving as the operations manager, but you created the operational systems and culture for Hotel Red. Yes, absolutely. As general manager, as the opening general manager, we were, I was fortunate enough to set the table and to really create the culture that is uh, hopefully still there now. I left uh, a few weeks, uh, a couple months ago, uh, for a new job as the president of Downtown Madison, Inc., which is a quality of life organization in downtown. Really, I'm just a great hospitalitarian for the city of Madison now instead of Hotel Red. And that's why I wanted to pull you in, because I'd, I'd, I'd known you as a friend, and I'd been to Hotel Ready many times and understood the hospitality culture there. But I learned from your bio, even though I've known you all these years, that you actually uh, are trained and barred as a lawyer in the best way, uh, worked in the political sphere, but before that were in the Peace Corps. So you understand uh, people and psychology and people skills in a different way than I realized. Yeah, actually, that, that's true. You, you actually learned that I was a lawyer uh, just a few minutes ago, and you and I have literally known each other pretty well for five, almost ten years now. Maybe ten, uh, yeah. So I've, hide, I've hidden my, my law degree well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Uh, all right, Lacey Reichwald, um, just to Jason's left. Uh, Lacey was fantastic for this panel, I thought, because what I wanted was this broad spectrum of people's experience and how they've developed their own culture within hospitality. Lacey has got two locations called the Sweet Spot in the Whitewater area? Yeah, the Whitewater area. And I found that fascinating, one, because of all of the community accolades that she came with, but two, because she's operating in an area uh, where she's doing something a little bit more sophisticated than you might imagine, but more importantly, she's pulling in folks that are really just moving through the years by way of their college degrees, but she has to imbue them with this great sense of purpose, of her purpose for the sweet spot. And that's its own talent in its own right, so I thought you'd really be a great asset. Did I get everything? Yeah, thank you, that's true. So um, Whitewater is a university town. Um, I still think that we have a wonderful turnover rate considering that we're a university town. The average employee stays with us between three and four years. And that's not a lot of time to instill a customer service culture into someone who's really there to learn how to do something else in their future. Um, but I keep in touch with a lot of our former employees and what I've learned over the years is that they take those skills with them onto whatever that next job is. Um, I've now been doing it long enough that one of my former employees has been a doctor for two years. So that's, I feel good about that. She stays in touch and says, I learned a lot at the sweet spot that I use in my bedside manner as a doctor. So. Wow, that's a huge compliment, yeah. Uh, to Lacey's left is my friend Joe Bartolotta. He's got, uh, he and his brother have got how many restaurants here? 16 restaurants and a few catering operations and um, uh, a, a great charitable enterprise called Carolotta that gives back tremendously to the community. Um, and I've known Joe for, I don't know how, I think about 95 when you opened Lake Park. Yeah, yeah they opened their first restaurant in 1993, Ristorante, uh, now celebrating your 25th anniversary and going through a bunch of, not, not really remodeling, but. Uh, I feel all 25 years. <laughs> Well, you look good. Um, and I've watched Joe grow uh, uh, their enterprise from one restaurant and then two 
navigate things like the Milwaukee County Park System and, and that kind of bureaucracy, be embraced by the community and have, uh, go from just you know a handful of employees that some of us knew by name to I don't know how many and still have We're this- We're close to a thousand right now. Yeah. It's a lot to manage. And, and, and still have this terrific employee culture. Uh, I can go from your burger spot on the lake to one of your fine dining destinations and have the similar touch but have it be tailored to where I'm at. So I thought you'd have a lot yeah, that, to share Yeah, that was always the biggest challenge for us is, is finding people and, and maintaining a certain level of culture. That's, that's all of our problems. We, you know, we all share the same challenges in our businesses and it's pretty much all centric around employees. And my father used to have an old Sicilian saying, the fish stinks from the head. Um, so it was a hard to think, you know, if you think about what that really means is that the head of a fish is the leader of the fish. So if the fish is bad, then the, the you know, the head is bad, the whole fish is going to be bad. Uh, that's how Italians think. I, I don't quite understand it. But, but, you know, as a leader of an organization, you have to walk the walk and talk the talk. And, um, you know, it's really important that you set the tone um, that that you care about your employees and you know we experience ridiculously low amount of turnover for as big as we are so it's a it's a testament to our managers and finding people who believe in the same core values that you do you know so uh, on the far left is Kate Cristobal and Kate is the director of cafes for a little coffee company you may have heard of called Collectivo uh, and it's a similar story with Joe and Paul in that um, I knew the original, or still do, knew the original three owners of, of what was then called Altera when they were three guys with a roaster and a, and a, um, a cart in a mall. Uh, and coffee was not uh, uber, it was not sexy, and people you know, didn't even know a light roast from a dark roast. Um, and now they've grown outside of Milwaukee and into Chicago and Madison, and as you were saying before, 500 employees. Uh, and you sell a heck of a lot more than coffee. One of my favorite stories about your bakery, uh, Troubadour, which I also think is just f fantastic baked goods, was uh, an internal meeting, and it's, I've been given permission to share this, but where the CEO said to one of the owners, because they were just so dedicated to the bakery, but they, they just needed to keep fine-tuning things, uh, he said, are you, I just want to check, are you trying to lose money? Because uh, <laughs> he said, no, 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 we believe in the bakery. It's coming along. Don't worry. There's a future here. Um, but within that culture, uh, I, I find Collectivo very interesting because it's a very brief exchange um, where in everybody else's, you have a, a longer time to, to touch the, the client, the customer through hospitality. Collectivo is, is uh, it's very brief. And a lot of times folks walk up on their phones or they've got something on in their mind and they just need to, to get through. But how do you embrace that, uh, that culture, really, that then plays through to the, to the client? Well, we found that we really have to read our customers because, yes, sometimes we have 30 seconds with someone, but sometimes we have six hours with someone as well. And sometimes they come to us for, let's be honest, a fix. Uh, they need that uh, coffee in the morning, but sometimes they want to learn about coffee. And so we have to be sort of all things to them, and we have to be able to read what their needs are right there in that moment. So we, we teach a lot of observation. Mm. So I want to begin all this with one quote from the great restaurateur Danny Meyer. Uh, many of you may have heard of him. He's got some really terrific restaurants in New York and the kind of a moderately successful burger chain called Shake Shack. Um, it's moderately, it's literally traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, but a quote of his that I've always loved that I actually had on my desk for a while is, um, the overarching concern to do the right thing well is something we can't train for. It's either there or it isn't. And I, I believe that's true, but you all encounter that and you all encounter that on a day-to-day -day basis. So if it is either there or it isn't, how do you choose those people when, say, you're opening up Harbor House and you need 150 people or a new cafe and you need, I don't know, however many, 60, or you have your cafe where there's just three or four or at the hotel and you've got maybe too little or too many uh, applicants, but you want to get the ones that have painted themselves red. How do you make those choices? Uh, well, in, in our case, um, <clears throat> we have a word and uh, 
whether I invent it or not, it's called Sparkle. And um, to me, I try to hire people with Sparkle. You know, I, I can teach anybody to do anything. But like Danny alludes to, uh, uh, and we've believed it for years, is that I can't teach you to be a good person. You know, so either you have the heart, the hospitality heart is what we call it, uh, to want to extend yourself um, for the benefit of others. Um, and, 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 you know, typically in, a, in an interview, uh, you, can, you can find out pretty quickly within a few minutes whether somebody has that special sparkle, you know. And uh, there are times when we've done mass hirings, and I'll be honest, we've, we've looked at people and just out of sheer numbers had to hire people if they, ha if, if they could fog up a mirror or we, they had a pulse. You know, we, sometimes we had, we had to make those decisions. It's amazing I haven't worked for you at some point. Yes, because yes. I was going to say, I, I should apply for a job. There you go. No. But, but that becomes a greater challenge for us because at that point, to take that person and mold them into something that fits our culture. And that's, the, that's sort of the challenges of the new workforce right now, is finding people who, uh, years ago, a little bit, it was a little, a little bit easier. Uh, but today, uh, just finding that spark, uh, gravitate towards sparkle. Okay. Since we have less time, we actually call it a spark. Uh, we <laughs> <laughs> Do they have the spark? <laughs> So, you heard that here first. That's really great. <laughs> so we are looking for people that have, that are kind, that we think will be gracious, that we think have empathy. And we're also looking for people who are energetic and bright and thoughtful. So, but it, we, we do distill it down to that one word and we say, do they have that spark? Are they, are, we... We've all said in that interview where you ask someone why they applied with us and they say, well, I, you know, I have to pay my rent. That's, <laughs> yeah. It's not, should not That's, be the main motivating right. factor to but, be here behind but this counter. some of the answers that we get are just amazing. And so many people say, I've been a customer here and I've always had great experiences. Right. And that is one of the things that really drives us and, and helps us to understand when we get that kind of feedback from people how, um, how we're doing. It's great. Perfect. A couple of things that I, that I really enthusiastically believe what they say is energy and empathy. Those are two really important things. You cannot, you really can't train energy, right? I mean, they either have it or they don't. And empathy is probably something that has taken a lifetime to gain. So those are two things. But the one that I think in the hotel business, it was very important for us was something called emotional intelligence. So these are people that can read what is happening very quickly. And in fact, uh, Kate was mentioning they train it. We train it in the hotel business usually with personality traits to understand who you're talking to and who you're working with as, as um, the, the guest at the hotel or in the cafe. If the person has high emotional intelligence and can read a situation and understand what is going on in even just a 30-second transaction, or Joe probably has a, a two-hour transaction, I have a sometimes a, a, a week-long transaction with guests. If they have high emotional intelligence and they can read what is happening and what that guest needs even before they do in a proactive way, they're going to go a long way. And if you interview and you ask the right questions, you can figure out what that, their level of emotional intelligence is and how far they're going to go. Absolutely, and we, um, we even start that before the interview process. Part of our application is, why do you want to work here? And I skip right over any application that doesn't have a good response to that question. And I do think that things have been getting harder. About 10 years ago when I was doing all of the interviewing myself, I think it was about 50% of applicants had that spark or that sparkle, and I wanted to get to know them more. I feel like now it's maybe one in 20. I'm, part of that is my own standards have gone up, but um, part of it is just there seems to be more of that. I just need a job. And usually that's where I end the interview. Um, if I feel that there's a gut connection with someone, then I might change it to tell me what you're passionate about. And then you can kind of find out, are, you, are they just nervous? Are they um, not connecting with me right away? But if they can start talking about something that they're passionate about and start to open up, then you might be able to see that that sparkle, um, because that sparkle to me 
I'm going to start using that word. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> For us, that's like that's that initiative. If they don't have something behind their eyes that lights them up, they're not going to take the initiative when they see a customer looking at their coffee cup. They're just going to walk the other way instead of going up to that customer and saying, hey, is there something I can do for you? How are you enjoying your coffee? What can I do for you? That comes, that um, initiative comes from some kind of inner drive and passion to just, to excel, to do well. So you've got that great group. You've got those key people. You're, you're, you're moving along. And uh, to really put it in, I mean, your business is its own living entity, right? A, a restaurant, a cafe, a bakery, a, a, a hotel. It's, it's its own living thing, if we're really honest about it. And then, of course, you've got employees, and they're, they're alive. <laughs> well, and they're, they've got lives outside, and then they have their living entity within this experience, which is really, it's what Danny Meyer and so many others talk about, is that it's that uh, sense of... Uh, existential relation, really, with someone that's come in, that's chosen your place above all the other options. How do you, how do all of you, how do you then counteract and rebalance that fatigue that we all feel from, from being nice? I mean, even if you have that sparkle, the spark, the what have you, the emotional intelligence, it still, it gets tiring. When you're, when you're, I've talked to chefs about that, where they're, they're putting out all day, they come home, they feed 200 people, but they come home empty. And I know servers and cafe folks and hoteliers, and so we all experience it. So how do you rebalance that for your, for your people within your culture so they can come back tomorrow? I, I think one of the key things is understanding early, right at the beginning of the process, what is the motivation for your employee? Why are they there? They may be there to, to, to work in the hotel business. They want to work their way up at UW or in Whitewater. Let's, let's be honest, they're there to go to university. And so there may be ways to motivate them based on that. If I can train them how to show up to work on time, how to do the basics of a professional life. I mean, I have got people that used to work at Hotel Red. Our shuttle driver right now is a PhD student in microbiology. Great guy, by the way. He is, Kamaro yeah. Henry, wonderful also guy. Terrifically yep. funny. <laughs> But his motivation is not to work at Hotel Red. That's not why he's in Madison. But, he, but his motivation is twofold. One, to go to school, but two, to meet people. So if you put him in a position where he can meet more people, aka a shuttle driver, he's much more likely to succeed. So early on, understanding what their motivation is and how you can um, facilitate that to let them grow to whatever they want to be. If it's a zoologist or they want to continue in the restaurant business, understanding motivation is a really important part of getting employees uh, to keep that energy level up. Yeah, at the sweet spot in Whitewater, because it is such a small community and a tight-knit community, and so many of our employees are coming from outside of the community, I really try to make it known from the beginning, you are expected to assimilate into this community. And it's that's not uh, like a you will do this, but more of a you, I promise you that you will get more joy out of this job if you get to know the people who come in. I mean, in a coffee shop and cafe environment, we're very lucky we get to know our customers. We have regulars that we see every day and they really become a part of the lives of our staff and we'll congratulate them on exams. Um, one of our employees is a music major and two of our customers went to see her performance last week and those are the kinds of um, experiences that our employees have that I think keep them going and keep them motivated. And then I also think it's important that accolades don't stop at me. I hear a lot of great things at my staff or about my staff throughout the community. Someone will run into me and say, Jenna gave me great service the other day. That's Jenna right there. And it's really important for us to make sure that that gets passed down the line, that it doesn't stop at us and we don't, oh, we're doing such a good job because Jenna did a great job for me. No, Jenna did a great job. She needs to hear that. Joe, Kate, anything to add? Well, you know, one of the things that we talk about um, often with newer coworkers is they have to take care of themselves because they have to be to work at 5 a.m. And we give away free coffee all day long. So if you don't get enough sleep, you're overtired, and you come to work at 5 a.m. and just drink a lot of coffee, um, it's real that you're not maybe going to be as gracious. And so we talk about that. We don't take for granted that that's a thing. And I, I even got the talk when I first started because you don't realize how much coffee you might be consuming. And something that was a very small problem got a lot bigger. 
for no reason other than caffeine. So we talk about that and we make sure that we're planning our shifts so people do get breaks and they do get to eat and we don't schedule clopins. Um, we're very careful about taking care of our employees in that way. And if someone's having a bad day, we might, you know, we'll take them out of the customer view to do some backstocking and maybe, maybe work a little more in the kitchen. So. Just a couple of points. Uh, the restaurant industry, is, as I think we all know, is sort of a unique blend of personalities and people. Uh, we have found that there's a lot of individuals in our company who have gone to college, procured degrees, can't find work in their field, and end up falling back on the restaurant industry. Uh, you know, and some of my best and brightest people are highly degreed, highly educated, um, but for some reason get caught in this, I don't want to call it a trap, but it works for us, you know, uh, this cycle <laughs> where, where, you know, they, they work five, six hours a night, you know, they can make 30 bucks an hour maybe, you know, if they do well in tips uh, or more. And, you know, I, I see a lot of our servers get in that groove. And, and uh, it, it's important to, to understand that, that the skills that they learn and, and you know, acquire uh, working in the restaurant business are skills that they will take with them for the rest of their lives. So, uh, you know, you alluded to it earlier in that when, when, uh, when a pharmaceutical comes in and makes an offer to my server to go sell pharmaceuticals, which happens often, uh, you know, they're doing it because they see the sparkle that we did, and they know that they've dealt with stressful situations, working one-on-one, -on -one, handling the needs of the guests, and those people make great salespeople. And so uh, the tools that you learn in our industry are, are just unprecedented. And, and too often today, as part of our hiring problems, is the, the young people coming into, into our industry have, have lost some of the social skills that are required to be a success. They, they spend all this time looking at their phones and can't actually have a discussion face to face. And uh, so we have some obstacles, but I think the, the key is that we've found is, is continue to cultivate people and give them tools, show them a road to success and a path to success, and, and they'll stay with you a lot longer. On, you know, to get back to that sort of w what keeps people energized and how you keep people going, because you know, we, the one negative with the hotel business is we're literally open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? So someone, multiple people are working at all times. And you may not know, but a hotel, where I used to work, Hotel Red is directly across the street from Camp Randall Football Stadium. So we would have these massive football games. I'm talking thousands, if not tens of thousands of people through our doors and how you keep people motivated. Not always on their best behavior <laughs> either. Let's just, I'm just going to put that no, out there. No, no, no. They do like their beverages. Uh, the, the, the key, though, for me, that always worked to keep people motivated is what I did, right? So you can probably already tell I'm a bit of an energizer bunny, and I am someone that believes by leading, leading by example, right? And so when it's really getting rough and, you know what, I've got to clean up a situation in the bathroom, I'm the one that's going to go do it. If there's extra dishes piling up and the dish crew is doing an, an amazing job already, but they need that extra oomph, it's me that's going to do that, take care of that situation. And I think you'll see that in a lot of your restaurants and, and, and taverns and bars, that that will go a very long way to motivate people. Maybe not in that immediate, but it will later on when they're tired. You know, I saw Jason, you know, take off his sport coat and, and go to work. And, and it's all of our jobs to make sure that the guest is happy. That, to me, was a, a tactic that, it's not a tactic, it's actually what I believe in, that really does motivate people and keeps their energy level up. One of one of the um, one of my favorite restaurant tours is a guy that has a couple of spots here in Milwaukee, Carl Kopp, custard places and the best custard, and uh, and then Elsa's, and then he's got a restaurant in New York and one in um, Phoenix. And uh, it was years ago when I went in looking for him, and I was in my twenties, and he was, and I don't suggest this for every restaurant tour, but he was in the kitchen uh, helping clean out the grease traps, and I flat out said to him because I was in my twenties, what what the hell are you doing? And he said, well, I mean, it's my grease. And I don't want ever to ask anyone to do anything that they haven't seen me already do. Lift a chair over his head to get it, you know, for the dining room, clean out an ashtray, what have you. And I don't need, I don't think you have to take it to that level every day. 
But when things got to that level, and I think that's one really vital way. Um, but as we all know in the hospitality industry, so it's this lovely word that came from Latin uh, that meant both host and guest. And I, I've always adored how things evolve, especially within the culinary spectrum, because what the words that we use every day say so much about our culture. So it's this great word that brings the two together. Um, but people can be really mean to our employees and to our staff. And it really often has nothing to do with them. So how do you turn those moments around for them? How do you take, you know, when they're, they're really just doing their job uh, to the best of their abilities, um, how do you take that moment and keep them engaged because you want them to stay. You don't want them to say, ah, I can't, I can't work in this cafe any longer. It was that kind of customer. We, we work really hard at talking about a fundamental belief that we have, which is that people are good. And I know that sounds very Pollyanna. simple. <laughs> it does. But we believe, and we say it often, and when we talk about that, if we do have a particularly difficult customer who is... We used to talk about them having a bad day. And hopefully what we did will help their day be better. But we, we don't go behind a door and talk about uh, our customers in a negative way. We look at ourselves and say, what, was there something that we did that made this situation go sideways? But we talk about our beliefs that people are good very frequently. And if you work in the coffee industry, for example, sometimes there's a, a customer that will come in, order two shots of latte or two shots of espresso on ice in an extra large cup. And we all know what's going to happen. They're going to go to the stir station and they're going to add milk and they just saved a little bit of money. And our belief Wow, really? Uh, so I've taught you all something. There go my profitability. But but what we learned is that there's a reason that they're doing that, and we will happily sell you two shots of espresso from now until the end of time. And we will do it and not judge. And it makes it frictionless for the coworker. They don't have to worry about trying to protect the business because that person's getting a little extra milk. And it makes the customer feel good too. On the flip side of that, I've actually fired customers, you know, um, and uh, uh, I think thanks to my brother, uh, we came up with a great line. Um, Please don't ever give us the opportunity to ever disappoint you again. Um, <laughs> so you got to think about it for a that's, moment. Yeah. That's, that's Please don't give us the opportunity to ever disappoint you again. <laughs> uh, and and it's, it's multiple offenses, but when they become abusive to your to your employees, and some people are, uh, you gain a lot of points also by supporting your employees, you know, and standing up for them. And I had one recently, and, you know, there was a huge cheer in the restaurant when I told them that, you know what, you're just not welcome here anymore. I'm sorry. You've just abused my staff to the point where I, I can't allow it to happen anymore. And he goes, you told me not to come back? I said, yeah, I am. There's plenty of other steakhouses. So... You know, so you never want to do that, but but it's important to support your employees. That's a really big thing. It's a big cultural thing, to, so they know that you're when it really comes to it, you're on their side. Yeah. And yeah. well, the guest is the most important person, but your employees are your guests too. They they don't own the business. They may stay longer than your customers. You know, a few years, but they're they're your guests, and they are absolutely your number one priority because they're going to take care of the rest of the guests and I think your team has to know that you have their back. I've also fired customers. I've said um, we want to make sure that our customers are completely satisfied and since you can't be satisfied I'm not sure that you're the right customer for us. Um, usually though it's after it's after some sort of abuse. It starts with please stop swearing at my employee and then ends with you can now leave um, and that's really important. I've worked in places in the past where I felt like the customer's word was was the end all and be all and I had to take the abuse silently and that wasn't a good feeling. And I think that um, your team will stick it out longer if they know that you have their back. You know, first thing I gotta say, the customer's not always right. I hope we can all agree to that in this room. Uh, I this think you're safe in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's me. Um, the, 
what I would say is that when it doesn't get to that full extreme, and I agree completely, you know, I've had to evict guests in hotels. I've had I had to do it all with police, without police. The 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 key, though, for me, if you have a difficult guest, it's difficult but not maybe risen to that level. The most important thing, and this is really difficult for me personally, is to listen, to truly listen to what that person is saying. And sometimes they're saying one thing, but they mean another. Sometimes they say one thing, and it's something else in their life that is causing them to, to, to take it out on the server. And in if they don't get to that level where they need to be removed, really listening to understand what that is and taking time to just listen, that'll go a long way of disarming the person and walk, you know, talking them back a little bit and then you can figure out what's actually happening and then figure out a solution. And we have, a, in, the, in the hotel business, you know, some of my most problem guests, we had a major incident in, a couple of years ago um, and I would never have come back to the hotel if it would have happened to me. Uh, I was able to listen to that person, understand what was going on, and they've now become one of our best guests. So it can turn itself around that the most negative situation can become a real positive, and it's how you handle the situation. And the best way to start is to listen. Well, and I think um, empowering your staff at every level to handle those situations so that they can turn that situation around. It doesn't have to be, hold on, let me call my manager. Any single one of our baristas knows that they can listen and solve the problem and that I'm not going to come back and say, I can't believe you gave them a free coffee. I'm going to say, good job diffusing that situation and turning a bad situation into a happy customer. Mm. So I've got another, uh, uh, thank you. Um, I've got another Danny Meyer quote, and I think the response is a little bit more from Kate and Joe, only because uh, you have different concepts in your restaurant, uh, Joe, you and Paul do. And Kate, your uh, cafes, though they're all serving collecto Collectivo Coffee, they're, they're their own little entities. They have their own personalities. So uh, he had this great uh, statement where he said, you can write a service style man you can write service style in a manual. You cannot write hospitality style in a manual. Service should be one size fits all, whereas style is one size fits one. So, and please, uh, Jason, and, and um, uh, please, uh, either of you, jump in if, um, Lacey, if you feel this is, you've got stuff to add. But when you're, when you're adding in concepts, and I know this is something that we've heard from the Wisconsin Restaurant Association, that a lot of you are moving into second restaurants or tertiary restaurants or new concepts or putting a, a, a bar into one area, changing up your mix a little bit to stay relevant. When you, when you add in that new concept, you might have someone, say, at the steakhouse that would be ideal at, at uh, Harbor House, and you want to move them over, but you, you also don't want to hurt the rest of the team's feelings? Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? How do you keep the culture alive when you've got folks that are particular identities for those new locations or concepts? You, you can't play favorites, but still, you have to serve the business. I'll take a stab at this. I'm not fully understanding the question. I think where you're going with this is, uh, so we have a portfolio of restaurants that are all a little bit different from each other. Right. And and. And so we have North Point Custard, which is a seasonal operation on the lakefront that does burgers and custards. And we have one at the airport. And so very different. We have a couple of cafeterias, employee dining cafeterias, uh, one at Kohl's and one at the U.S. Bank. Uh, we have catering facilities. We have fine dining restaurants. We have a, a, a gastro pub uh, on Water Street. They're all they're all a little bit different. But the level of hospitality mm -hmm. and the level of customer engagement should be the same, you know, no matter what type of operation you're running. Even at North Point, you know, it, although they're coming up and ordering burger and a fries and, a, and a, a malt, we have to be hospitable. We have to be responsive. We have to get the food to them in an appropriate amount of time that's hot and fresh and the fries are crispy and beautiful and we buy a high quality fry we buy a, use a high quality burger patty you know would people really know that but we know that right and our employees we use black angus you know patties at, at, a, at a at a beach shack you know mm -hmm. and we probably wouldn't have to do that but when you so when you've got someone at north point for instance that really you see them and you think god they'd be perfect at lake park I can't even explain it. How do you move them within the company without offending the gang that stays at North Point? 
Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question, and it's probably some legitimacy uh, to that. I know that it helps a little bit because it's a seasonal business, and mm -hmm. you know we close our doors after Labor Day, so we have you know 20 people that we can move into our restaurants. Uh, yeah. But when but we from burgers to fine dining is a yeah, different. Yeah, when we do transfer people from place to place, that's a real motivator for people to come to work initially, even for our company, because uh, you know you can stay within our company for five, six, eight, ten years and have different experiences in each restaurant. You can learn Italian food and a seafood restaurant, a steakhouse, you know, a, a French restaurant. Right. So that helps us, you know, maintain who we have in our business because we have the ability to move and transfer people internally a lot. And what we're doing is we're really trying to move culture around sometimes because once you've trained them in one unit, then the transition should be pretty easy. You're not bringing an outside person in mm. because they already understand the culture. So the fits are a little bit quicker, a little bit easier. Yeah. You probably experienced that. Yeah. And when you hire bright people, they want to continue to learn too. So they seek out other opportunities as well. So you might look at them and think, oh, they would be really great at this cafe or they would be an, an amazing trainer. They've they, we just, part of our job is to let them know the paths that they can take. And we spend a lot of time talking about that when we're training people. We discuss like, oh, this is how I got here. And, and we publish any opportunities, any employment opportunities to the company first before we go outside. So people are often looking at what else is available and they move themselves. Mm. Jason, you have you have or Kate, you have I mean, Lacey, excuse me, you have insight on this. You know, I, I don't, and as someone that works in politics, usually I love every single question that gets asked to me, but <laughs> I do not have an answer for this one. I like it. I'll just reiterate a little bit um, that there's a lot of self-selection that seems to go on when, um, so we have two locations and sometimes someone is a better fit at one location than the other, but more often than that, it's about moving people up. And so you may have a great server that you want to move into a managerial position and they, they tend to self-select. One of the things that I have learned is sometimes it doesn't uh, benefit your business to take your best server and put them in a supervisory role because maybe they're their best they are a great server because they love that contact with customers and they really thrive off of that and then when you move them into a supervisory role where they have less one on one time with the customers they tend to flounder and just because you're really good at something doesn't mean that you're great at supervising it or training it so making sure that when you do move people around that they have the aptitude for that position um, you, it's like we don't want to take our best baker and turn that person into a manager where they're never baking cakes again. They wouldn't thrive and the business wouldn't thrive. You know, I do have something to say. I take that back. I want to I get on my soapbox here, and this is coming from the worst guy because I just left hospitality. You know what? One thing that one of my biggest pet peeves about the restaurant and the hotel business is that people look at customer service jobs as they are, that they're not careers. And let me just be very clear that when you decide to work in a restaurant or own a restaurant or be a server or work in a hotel, that is a career and it is a noble career. The, the science of working, of customer service and working with guests, not everyone has that. Not everyone can be trained in that and you should be proud of what you're doing. It's not a secondary career even if you are going to university to be a microbiologist. It is a career that, that offer so many rewards. And in America right now, where we are at low unemployment, and we're all struggling to find jobs, this is an area where people can still work their way up. I mean, I know countless general managers in hotels that don't have a college degree that work their way up from, from the laundry room to the, to the general manager position and, to, and into ownership. This is a one career arc that I still see that the American dream is still available. If you work hard, you can really rise up. And I, I want to make sure that people understand that this is a profession. And yes, I did just get out of it a few weeks ago. Um, but really, uh, I'm still in hospitality. I just do it on a larger level for a whole downtown area. I mean, there's really no difference. And, and Joe brought it up and Kate brought it up. The skills that we learn in these jobs are applicable to every career. And so let's, let's have fun in hospitality and be proud of your jobs. So, well, one okay. other problem that we've, we've problem, uh, opportunity uh, that we've uncovered is that um, oftentimes in our business, we can't promote fast enough. Uh, 
mm. you know, because we just don't have openings. And the, the the people want to climb that ladder quickly, and and if they sense a log jam or there's no upward mobility, you run the risk of losing them too. So it's important to keep your ear to the ground and and really identify, you know, your A team and and make sure you keep checking in with them often because there there's a lot of opportunities out there. Literally they could walk down the street and get jobs uh right. almost anywhere they right. want. You know, so it's 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 an important thing. And and if you've got long term managers in place who you sense are just not going to go anywhere, they're going to say, well, what do you got for me? If you got nothing, then it plants the seed about maybe moving on. How do you, before we, I think one more question and answer uh, this one, however you all feel is best, but how do you keep the culture going? We all think about employee cultures, that exchange between the server and the guest or the, you know, the counter or what have you, uh, or when they check into the hotel or check out. How do you keep the culture going when the, when the lights aren't on? Do you know what I mean? When the when it isn't showtime, but throughout the meetings and the prep and the rest of the day and so forth. I, I just I immediately thought, how do you keep the music playing? You know, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, the the, the challenging part is. Uh, uh, I guess I didn't really understand the question that well. Oh, and so when when you're not when you're not setting up when you're setting up for service when it isn't service when the customers aren't coming and you can train people hopefully and they've got that sparkle to touch the customer the right way to to look them in the eyes to really be tuned in to their their mood their state their order their interest their what have you but you know we all work a lot of hours if you're in the restaurant business and folks come in a heck of a lot earlier than when the customers do. So how do you keep that culture of you're important, you're treasured, you're key, you need energy, you were hired for a purpose, we like you? How do you keep that going? I, I think, uh, first of all, we feed all our employees a meal. We call it family meal, and everybody sits down before the shift, and we give them a meal. Uh, and... And that's an opportunity for the chef and the manager to go over specials to talk about things. Meanwhile, everybody's eating, and you know it's a small cost to the company. Um, a lot, a lot of restaurants handle it differently, but we prefer to sit down all as a group to create sort of a family type feeling to it. Uh, we found it's really, really beneficial. The other thing is continued and ongoing training. Give them opportunities to taste wine, to taste food. You know, give them, give them a story. St to me. Uh, stories are like one of the most valuable things that, that you can grab onto uh, and be able to take that information from that story and then share it with the guest. And, you know, one of the big trends today is authenticity and being real and, you know, farm to table. And and uh, you go a little bit too far with it, you know, uh, you, you, know, you don't is, need to meet the chicken. Right. This right. is, you know, you don't have to name the butter, you know, <laughs> the, yeah. from the cow it came from. Right. But, you know, but there are there are ways where you can tell a great story. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget my brother years ago told me about a wine. Uh, it was called La Crema Christi and, you know, the Tears of Christ. And it's it's grown on a on a mountain slope on Mount Vesuvius. And, you know, by by telling that story, you immediately are interested in that wine and you want to you want to you want to order it. Right. And so and it, everything comes with a story. And if you can talk about that, it creates a, a connection. We look for breadcrumbs that the guest leaves behind. And that's how you connect emotionally with the guest, looking for a breadcrumb, looking for an opportunity to create a relationship, an emotional connection with that guest. And, and you know, like, like you guys, you have the benefit. I may see a guest two or three times a year. You have the opportunity of seeing them, you know, sometimes two or three times a week. You a know, day. A day. Yeah. yeah. Which gives you more opportunity to play devil's advocate to, to screw up, too. I mean, <laughs> well, I don't yes, mean that no. in a bad way, but... It's a there, game of odds. There it are is. lots of restaurants, but as many <laughs> restaurants as there are, it seems like there'll never be as many more cafe. I mean, there's just, the, you know, there's coffee practically coming out of water fountains these days. I mean, it's everywhere. So for a guest to change their habit with you is even more fragile in some ways. It is. And you're right, there are more and more competitors. But going back to, you know, how do you maintain that culture? 
part of our mission statement is that everyone is a customer, and it talks about how we talk to each other before we ever unlock the doors, how we treat each other, and that resonates with how, th that impacts how we treat our customers. So if we are kind to each other, and again, I know it seems a little Pollyanna, but it, it matters. If, if there's something heavy from the basement that I need to carry up and someone just says, hey, let me help you with that, uh, and we're, we treat each other well, and we talk about this a lot. We, we don't assume that we go over something in onboarding. It enters conversations daily with our teams. It drives decisions, um, and it's very, very important to us. You guys do something very cool at one of your cafes where you put up your financials, kind of how different sectors are doing for everyone to see. And when I went in for a meeting and I saw and I understood that, I thought that's, that's investiture from your employees on a whole different level. Yeah. Because it's, you know, this is what the bakery ran. And here's, when they turn their lights off, they save this much. And I mean, that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we're, I mean, they understand that none of this happens without them. And that they have an impact. You know, and you talk about that with the customer too. I only have 30 seconds with you, but... What I do in those 30 seconds has a huge impact. I, I teach customer service in a class that we give, and I read cards that I've gotten from people I've never met that say, I was having a really bad day. Your team recognized that. They said, oh, what's going on? I explained to them I was going through a tough time. They were very gracious. And then when I came back the following week, they had all signed a card and said, we're so sorry about your cat. You know. We don't have an SOP that says when someone tells you that they've lost a family <laughs> pet, please get a card. This happened because they enjoy their work, they're empowered, and they're engaged with the customers. Mm -hmm. I think the, cool. the other way to keep that culture alive you know, when the lights aren't on is for me to not be married to the specifics of the culture. Over the last decade at the Sweet Spot, every time we have some staff turnover, our culture evolves. And at first I was very um, opposed to the change of the culture. Well, this is, this is my coffee shop and I want it to be run the way I want it to be run. <laughs> and it looks so different now than it did then. Um, and aren't you glad? I am so glad, I'm very glad because it means I'm less married to the business too. I don't have to be there monitoring everything Thing every minute of the day. Um, but so I am married to setting the standards for this is how our customers will feel when they leave the building and this is how we will serve and our service standards. But the actual culture is developed by whatever staff we have at that time. And I really give them the leeway to develop that. The, the feeling at each of our cafes is very different from one another. And it's very different now than it was a year ago, five years ago. But the standard of service is the same and I this is very hard for I think any owner or manager it was very hard for me I'm kind of a control freak but the more that I've let go the more that I enjoy being there honestly to me uh, culture community is a synonym for uh, synonym synonym Homonym. What am I trying to go for here? It's an eminem. <laughs> <laughs> eminem, 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 eminem. Uh, <laughs> Another word for uh, culture. If you create a strong community at, at each of these locations, and that's sort of the un overlying theme of all of what we're saying today, if you create a community, a strong community, that believes in what you're doing and what they're doing, and they're empowered to do um, what they, they can do, then you're going to create a community that will rise up if you're, if you're sick or you're tired or you don't want to be at work, no matter what that is, that community will all sort of rise together and everyone will do better. There's a, a one quote I want to leave you with and then let's open this up for questions, but I found this. I think it's, I think it's Joe Baum, the great restaurateur of Windows on the World and so many other restaurants, but he said, business is like life. It's all about how you make people feel. It's that simple and it's that hard. And I know a lot of you have your own restaurants and you have your own teams and in many cases you're, you're that one location uh, and, and it is that simple, but it is that hard because it's how you touch the folks that come in your door every day and choose your establishment over others. So uh, with that, are there any questions for anybody on the panel? Please don't be shy. Yes, sir. How do you, how do you keep that motivation and drive that culture in the back of the house? So in part of our training program, I think it's really important when we hire 
for example, a front of the house employee, uh, we run them through about three weeks of training, which is pretty pretty lengthy amount of commitment. Um, but but the first week they spend really in the back of the house and they actually work the line a little bit. They work elbow to elbow with some of our cooks, some of my chefs. They spend a full shift or a half a shift in the dishwasher uh, area. They spend you know one or two shifts at the bar, one or two shifts uh, at the host stand. And they actually work a little bit or touch each department within the restaurant. So they have a, a unique understanding of how important that dishwasher job is. You know, without a dishwasher, the restaurant grinds to a halt, you know? And that, so uh, there are, I mean, you've, we've all walked into busy restaurants at seven o'clock and just, you can't even see the dishwasher because he's literally buried in place, you know? And um, to your point, when you roll up your sleeves and, and help them out, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. So, uh, you know, being inclusive, uh, you know, letting them taste some of that wine, letting them taste some of that food. Um, you know, it, there always has been, and there probably always will be, a little bit of this divide between the front and the back of the house. And I have always been aware of it. I've always been uber sensitive to it. And I've always tried to figure it out. Um, and I don't have the perfect answer, but I think, you know, along with the with the kitchen, uh, you have to hire people who have commitment and passion. You know, a line cook is not going to have the same sparkle as 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 a bartender or a server, because they're more into the craft. You know, um, I don't know if that's a great answer, but I, it's a, it's a it's a great question. It's, it's a, a credit. Great question. It's a credit to your and Paul's restaurant. It was years ago. We were filming in one of your fine dining locations, and there was a moment, a lull, and I walked up to a woman at the pastry station, and I said, "I don't I don't know you. How long have you been in pastry?" And she said, "Oh, I'm not. I'm going to be a host." At, it was at the steakhouse. Yeah. And I had no idea you did this. And I said, well, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm training. And I thought, that's fantastic. Because you'll never fling a dessert into the garbage or you'll never not treasure something. You'll never, you know, it changes the paradigm so much when you understand what it's like when that dishwasher is buried behind plates and on and on. Anyone else to add? Well, it, this isn't from Colectivo, but several years ago I worked at um, Les Toile and I trained all of their wait staff. And I, now that I'm thinking about it, I didn't even realize it, but I was training empathy because it's really hot in the kitchen. And I would say things like, we, are, we as, wait, as servers are never going to come into the kitchen and complain about how hot it is out there. We will keep an eye on the water pitchers for the... Um, for all of our lines cooks. We will, we take care of them because they take care of us. And I even asked them what the relationship was like at the last place that they worked. And I sort of set the stage and said, we're different, we're, we're pretty special here. And it worked. And every once in a while, we'd all get together after work and have a drink uh, and the servers, bought the back of the house drinks because they knew they made more money. And they were nice, and they said, thanks, you had my back when that recook came back twice. Appreciate it. So it's, it's just, you have to set the stage for those cultural things, and you have to continue to communicate those things. You have an idea in your mind, but you, you have to live it every day and talk about it every day. Or it, we're very protective about our culture, and we do talk about it a lot. Um, to our coworkers, to our managers, because it's so important. Another question? I have a question. I'm not going to be asked so much in a lot of the community, but like, the smaller community where we've got a pretty limited amount of work home. Um, what do you think about the fact that there's a lot of people in the community that are like, if somebody gets hired away from someone, they go down the road, all of a sudden, uh, another you know, restaurant goes, well, that's the best little thing you just hired from them. How do you guys deal with that? How do you address that? Does it happen? <laughs> Does, it happen? <laughs> Does, it happen? Does everyone, did everyone hear the question? In essence, is uh, in a smaller community, when you've got a restaurant and one of your employees gets hired away and then there's some, some backlash, essentially. I don't... 
Yeah, yeah. When you when you lose talent and and there's that type of competition, how do you handle that? Uh, and and not kind words relative to the <laughs> the job move, I guess. Well, it, it's just um, I, I feel your pain. It happens to us often, you know. And it's 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 poaching, you know. And I, I think you have to you have to you know wake up and look in the mirror every morning and know that you know that's something that that's a something that we don't do uh, as a company. We have a pretty pretty hard line on soliciting other people's employees. I'm assuming you want to create an atmosphere or a situation that you want. Well, that's, that's part of it. They want to come to work for you, you know, but... It's not bad, you know, when people say those types of things, they want to do So, in a small community, our community is pretty small, um, I have made a point of befriending the other restaurant owners. And it's really important that we all stay in touch. So if I get an application from someone that listed a reference from one of my friends that owns a restaurant down the street, I call them right away. Say, hey, I received an application from so-and-so. You know, what? what's the deal? Sometimes it's, oh, I don't have enough hours for her. She's looking for 20 hours. Go ahead. Sometimes it's, do not touch that, you know, either, either I'm about to let that person go or I like that person so much if you poach them from me, we'll never speak again. Um, I really think that befriending and staying in touch and, and recognizing that, of course, there's competition, but everybody can win, too. The more um, popular all of the restaurants are in a small community, the more the whole community can win. Um, so I think being wary of the competition, but also utilizing that network for the good of all as well can can be very helpful. And then making sure that you're the one that everyone wants to come to instead of losing people to the other restaurants, which can be challenging, but um, I, I think that helps. Any other questions? Uh, yes, sir, and then we'll go to you, ma'am. People like uh, during the interview process, uh, you find people like Sparkle or people like that, that So I think the question is, what are the telltale signs, the questions you can ask in an interview that really alert you to this person's got the spark or the sparkle? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So, so in our in our company, it's an at will state. So you know everybody's sort of on probation, and we don't we don't hire 100 percent of the time. I mean, we we do have some mishires. That does happen. Uh, oftentimes, once they get within the culture, the culture ex itself sometimes pushes people out because they just don't feel comfortable. You know, it's like when you take the last knife out of the silverware drawer and you say nothing to anybody, you know, that's not a healthy culture. And there are people who have, you know, done that and they just don't fit in. Um, I think if, if, you're, if you're, you know, you have the opportunity to fix a bad hire, but fix it quickly. Don't let that cancer into the door um, for too long if you really think it's not a great fit. And actually, our interview process is not that quick. I think that we do a phone screen, we do a first interview, and we do a second interview. And we do check references. And I'm always amazed at what we hear at the references. I, I think that some, I've worked in concepts where they skip that stage, and, and you regret it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the second interview, people often relax and they think, I've, I've got this now. And in relaxing, they might show a little bit more of some attitudes or personality that wouldn't fit with your culture. Um, but I look for people who smile at me first, and then I smile back. I, I can't teach you to smile. 
if I stand behind you and say, please smile, that's so annoying. <laughs> Nobody's going to do that. So I've given up. I can't do that. So I, I want someone who, who has that spark, who has that, who's going to smile. I smiled at you. You smiled right back at me. That's great, right? Um, what that nonverbal is. I used to have a GM that used to start the interview at one place and say, you know, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Um, can we move over there? And they would move quickly. And if the person would follow quickly, they would see if they had energy. I, I, I don't do that, but wow. I thought it was sort of interesting. When I used to choose line cooks, I would see how they worked in the dish station often. And that's where I'd start their training because I could see how organized they were and how neat they were and how fast they could work. So there's a lot of little things like that. You have to be a very careful observer because anyone can go on the internet and get the right answers. Um, so there's a lot of nonverbal that happens. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, the other thing is I think that you're never going to see someone better than you see them at their interview. People come to an interview prepared and ready, and, and that's the best you're going to get them. So if you don't want them in your restaurant after that, it, it's, they're, they're never going to show up better than that, I guess, is what I've learned. I mean, maybe they're a little nervous. Maybe they'll be a little bit more outgoing. But um, if there's anything that's off to me, then I know it's only going to go downhill from there. And I think you just have to be really, you have to be picky. Um, and I ask a lot of situational questions instead of tell me, tell me about your experience. Uh, tell me, you know, instead of just asking them about their job experience, saying, tell me about a time that you had to deal with a difficult customer and how did you handle that situation? Or, um, or the question earlier, tell me what you're passionate about and just really getting to know people. I, when I used to sit in the cafe and do interviews and then the person would leave, my behind the counter staff could always tell how it went by how long it took. If it was a five minute interview, they knew that person had no chance. But if it was a 20 to 30 minute interview, then they knew, okay, Lacey really enjoyed talking to that person. Um, if they can make me laugh, if they can keep me engaged. And if, they, if I want to talk to them for 20 to 30 minutes, then I want to work with them. If it's five minutes, <coughs> they're not going to cut it. You have anything to add, my friend? Yeah, the only thing I would say is in the interviewing process is a two-way street. So if you're prepared and you know exactly the kind of person you're looking for and understand the job description, then you're going to be in a much better position to find that person. Great, yeah. Um, Miss, I know you had a question, and then we're, let's wrap up because I, I believe they need this room for something other than what we're doing here today. Uh, no, 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 please. We'll no, no, no. We, 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 we'll we want to hear your question. We've got time. Come on. I insist. I know, right. Well, if you have a situation that you hire somebody for a serving job, and you have a customer that you want to get to know, and you want to get to Did everyone in the room hear the question, the situation? Yeah. Okay. That actually yeah. happened recently w with us. We had a, a, a server. We promoted him to a manager. He did pretty well at that entry-level manager. We promoted him to a bigger unit, and he was really struggling. And um, it's a very tough conversation, but uh, he knew he wasn't succeeding as well. So it's a mutual understanding. He had great value for us. We reassigned him to a different restaurant that was more suitable to his skill set. Uh, my situation is a little bit different, perhaps, than yours. Um, you know, we didn't want to terminate him uh, because he was a great guy and great. And he had everything that we wanted. It was just the wrong fit. And sometimes, you know, we make mistakes. You know, uh, in in a single unit where you promote somebody, it's really hard, I think, to make him a, a server again. 
because now he's failed at a manager job and he doesn't he may or may not have the respect of the employees it's it's a tough call on that one we can move them to different restaurants <laughs> so you're gonna have to expand there you go yeah, buy yeah. another restaurant yeah. yep <laughs> duh <laughs> well, this is you know with any coworker that is not performing well when you sit down to have that final conversation, there's nothing in there that's going to be a surprise because you've been showing them all along where they're not meeting expectations. And I think that oftentimes where we are now, we don't even get to that final conversation because they understand that this isn't a good fit for them. They know we value them, we promoted them, we, you know, we trained them, we did everything we could. So what might be a better fit? And I think those people really appreciate those honest conversations too. Like, let, what else can we do here? Because y you were a rock star when you were a server, you know? And maybe you're a server and you have some additional um, responsibilities as well. If you're able to do that, you know, it's maybe a compromise in that as, as well. Well, thank you, folks. If you enjoyed this, if this was helpful, uh, or you have any other feelings, let the Restaurant Association know. They've got comment cards. You can send them an email. I want to thank my panel members for taking time out of your professional days. Some of you drove across Hilldale in the state to be here. We're very grateful. And uh, thanks, everyone. Have a great show. Thank you.